as they were telling me what the game was today, I thought, what we need to do is understand that prayer does not happen instantaneously. Have you ever prayed for things for a long period of time? And sometimes we give up on that prayer. We have a child going in the wrong direction. Our marriages are in chaos. Our finances is going in the tanks. We have somebody that we love that is passing away and dying. We go to the hospital room and we get on our knees and we pray. We hold our hands and ask God to do something supernatural. We want something from the very desires of our hearts. And so often we get on our knees and we say a prayer and we want God to audibly give us an answer. And he wants, he, we want him to give us the answer in which we are praying for. We want our answer to be the right answer. And sometimes God doesn't give us our answer because sometimes what we are praying for is not what God desires. So we have to take a look at what prayer is all about. And one of the things that we have to look at, number one, is prayer is not to change God's mind. We can fervently pray, but God has given us a direct instruction in the Word of God on what prayer is and what prayer is not, and how we use prayer, and what prayer can do for us. See, prayer can be one of the simplest things that we could ever have. It's one of the easiest disciplines that we can do. But it's one of the first things that when anything takes place within our life, it is the one thing that goes on the back burner. I've had many people talk to me, and I said, well, how many, how's your spiritual life? And one of the first things they say, ah, it's been a long time since I've prayed. And prayer is the ability to get our hearts communed with God. It's the ability for God to open up our lives and to share things within our life. We've all known things that we've prayed for. We've sincerely desired. And it never came to pass. So why are we asking, did God just not answer our prayers? Or did we pray the wrong way? Did we pray for the wrong thing? Or did God just say, maybe not yet? Maybe not yet. People pray to God, and they give their prayer problems to God. And sometimes, as soon as we say a prayer... We have said, well, I've already given it to God. I, I, I asked God one time for something, and, and God didn't give me an audible yes, or he didn't give me an audible no, so I just gave it to God, and I just quit praying about it. And I truly believe if prayer is something that we need and we have a desire for, it's not going to just take a minute to win it. It's going to take a desire from our heart to be compassionate about the desires that God has for us. So there's some things that we want to talk about. If the, if the request is wrong, God will just say no. What do you mean if the request is wrong? That means if, if, if you desire something, and you have a heart desire for it, but it is against God's word, God has mandated himself that he cannot lie and he cannot go against what he has already said. So when we pray a prayer that's against God's word, the answer has already been given to you and the answer is no. God cannot go against his will, against his character. We know that. Young Christians, young kids that are trying to think about getting married and, and they pray diligently for that person and, and uh, they fall in love but they fall in love with somebody that's not a believer. So they ask the pastor and they ask mom and dad, say J just pray pray that, pray that we can get married and they offer the prayers to God and God doesn't answer them in audible voice but God has already given to them the very mandate of the word of God 
And when we know what the Word of God is, and we know what God has said, and if we go against God's Word, but yet we say, God, I need you to bless this. God cannot bless what he's already given us clear instruction for. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 and 15, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for the fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness. And what com communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with the devil? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? You're just asking for trouble. Because how could you walk together if you do not agree? So when you're saying, I want God to bless me when I'm doing something against God's word, and he's already given us that mandate, what we're asking for is God to bless something that he cannot bless. He's already given us the word. And if we know the word to be true, and we believe God's word, what we must do is we must not say, I want to be married to this person. What we must do is, God, give me the person you want me to be married to. And moms and dads, we've been praying for this for a long time. I finally got, I finally got my, my troublemaker kid. He's 22 years old. And uh, he's, he finally decided to get married. He, he probably asked 30 different people, but he finally found this one person <laughs> to marry him. And uh, he met, he's been dating this girl that's been going to our church here for a long time. And they've been dating for seven or eight years. And uh, she, she said yes. So on June 18th, they're getting married. Uh, congratulations, Brett. Um, I can't believe she said yes, but congratulations. Um, but you know, that is something that we have been praying for for his entire life. For him to find a woman that loves God and loves him, and they are yoked together in Christ. Because that's a biblical thing to pray for. Because many of us have seen, and many of us have maybe even experienced, that unequally yoked together mindset, and how God wants to bless you, then you pray for something that God desires for you, and yet we desire something else. And sometimes our prayers just have to be said, God says no. He may not say it in an audible voice, but he says it in a voice that we understand, and that voice is the very word of God. So we must know what the word of God says to understand what our prayer is. And our prayer has to be, God, I want to be honored by you, and I want to know what God's word says. And if my prayer is hindered, if my prayers are lined up to God's word, I know his answer is yes. If we ask anything in my name, Anything, if it's lined up in God's word and it's in his name and you are mature enough and spiritual enough that you can handle it, God will give you the very desires of your heart. But what we must do is make sure that we are where we need to be spiritually. The second thing, if the timing is wrong, God will say, slow down. I'm going to be slow. Maybe you are not mature. Maybe you're not ready for this. Maybe you don't understand what will take place if you receive this at this moment of time. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We have to seek God. And he knows if you receive this, you will never have what truly God truly wants for you. And sometimes he's just going to say, I want you to have that. But maybe you're not ready for that right now. You know, uh, growing up, our parents always said, you know, pray, pray diligently for whatever you want and, and God will give it to you. So this little eight-year-old girl was, was wanting a birthday present and, and uh, she was very immature in a lot of things that she did, but she was diligent. She was on her knees before God and saying, God, I want this present, I want this present, I want this present. And God didn't give it to her until she was 42 years old. There's a little Shetland pony in her front yard. Sometimes what we desire when we're eight years old Maybe we're not ready for it until we're 42 years old. And when we're 42 years old, we don't really want what we wanted when we were eight years old. Sometimes what we pray for seems so small, but yet it can impact our life. 
Sometimes we just have to say, listen, I need to slow down. I need to understand what God is doing. God's delays are not necessarily God's denials. God's delays are not necessarily God's denials. There's some things that we need to pray for. And if we do not hear an audible no, and we know that God's word isn't against it, what we must do is we must humbly stand in the gap in prayer, and we must slow it and make sure that God hears, and we are open to God's working within our life. We just need to sometimes be faithful in our prayers. Be faithful in our prayers. That means it's not just a minute prayer. That means the things that we desire within our life, that we are not seeing God's hand move, we have to faithfully go before God and pray. Seek his face. What we must, what we have to do, is it has to be a burden on you. And the thing that is a burden on you, and you're praying for God to open up that door of opportunity and to answer that prayer, if it is a one and done, if it's I get up in the morning, I'm going to pray one time, and I hope God takes care of it. Sometimes God is using the prayer and the compassion of your heart to move you into doing something great for him. But if we do not have passion, if we don't have vision, if we don't have direction, and we say, Lord, I want you to take care of it. Well, God sometimes, we treat God sometimes like he is Santa Claus. Gimme, 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 gimme. And sometimes we are like a little child at the checkout stand that sees a piece of candy, that desires that piece of candy. And mama said, no, you're not going to have that piece of candy. And we've all seen it. They go ballistic. They start crying, throw the temper tantrum. Mom's embarrassed. The child is going crazy. So sometimes either mom's going to yak that little boy up or little girl up, and they're going to get out of there. Or sometimes, unfortunately, okay, just this one time, Shuts that child up in a second. But what have we trained that child? If you cry hard enough, you cry long enough, you embarrass mom enough, you're going to get that piece of candy. They learn it very early. Somebody give me an amen to that. But you're sitting there at the checkout stand and you're watching that. And you're saying, dude, you need to just take that child out and just... <laughs> but sometimes they don't do that. And sometimes I believe we treat God as that spoiled little daughter treats her mother. Sometimes we throw our temper tantrum. Sometimes we get upset and we say, why? And God is teaching us early on in our life that if it is God's will, we have to have passion for that. And it has to be so sincere. And we have to be prepared for that prayer. But just because he doesn't give it to us today doesn't mean he's not going to give it to us tomorrow. Just because we pray for something today doesn't mean it's going to be instantaneously fixed tomorrow. Sometimes it takes work. Sometimes it takes dedication. Sometimes it takes change in order to get things done. But if you're wrong, if you're wrong in your prayer, Sometimes God will say, you need to grow. You need to grow. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If I have sin in my life, it is the hindrance for my prayer to God. Is the iniquity in my heart. It's the immaturity within my life. And what God is saying, I, I cannot hear because of the sin within your life. What we must do is we must get rid of the sin, must get rid of the relationship problems and have God as a pure vessel within our life. Sometimes God is saying, I want you to have this. I desire for you to have this. But what I desire more for you to grow, to be spiritually strong, to do what God has asked you to do, do what God wants you to do. If you're wrong, what does that mean? It means it's not... It's not as easy as offering up a prayer. Say, God, will you fix this? Will you do this? 
God, give me. And, and we're asking God to give us that supernatural relationship pill or that forgiveness pill or that relationship pill. And if you just take this pill tomorrow morning, everything's going to be wonderful and great within your life. As a pastor, I wish I had tons of those pills. I'd give a pill for this and a pill for that, and everybody would be great. But you know what? Everything in life is very difficult. It takes a lot of work, and it is hard. You know, even in Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24, it says, if you go to the altar, if you go to church, and you try to leave your gift or even your prayer at the altar, and you remember a, a sin or an ought that you have against somebody else, it said, leave your gift at the altar, go make it right, and then give your gift to God. Because here's what God is saying. It doesn't make any difference what you try to do for me or to me or with me. If you have a problem, a sin, you make that right. Because if you make your sin or your relationship right, then God will open up his heart and receive that gift, receive that ministry that you have, and bless you through it. It's easy to do things as long as we can ignore God. We don't have to necessarily work on our relationships. We don't have to ask God to forgive us of our sins if we don't focus on God. But when you're in the house of God and you know that you have a sin within your life, you know that there's a relationship rift within your life, and you say, I want everybody to think I've got it all together. God is saying, dude, hypocrisy is a stench to my nostrils. Leave your gift Leave your ministry at the altar and go make it right. And then when you come back, that sweet-smelling aroma from your gift will come up to God and he'll have his hand of blessing. Not only on your gift, not only on your ministry, but on your relationship that was once broken. It is so important not to just say, I want God to bless me. What we must say is, God, I want you to use me. I need to get up and do what God wants me to do. And sometimes we're asking for prayers. And God says, I want to give it to you, but you're not ready for it. I want to give it to you, but you cannot handle what you're asking for until you grow spiritually. And when you grow, when you see, when you learn, and you'll see my hand of God working, and God can do wonderful things if we open up our heart and open up our lives and see his working, then we can say, thank you. Thank you for not giving to me what I asked for. Thank you for giving to me what I needed. Because my ways are not near as good as God's ways. My thoughts are nothing compared to God's thoughts. And if I ask God in my carnal mind what I want, and say, God, I don't care what you want for me, I want what I want. God said, you're not ready. You cannot handle what I want to give to you. But when we humbly go before God and we ask God and say, Lord, I want your will to be done. I want the thing that you want for me. I want my life to be the way that you want my life. I want you to put into my life the, the woman or the man that you want me to marry. And God orchestrates that. It is the sweetest thing that we could do because we're not pushing God. We're asking God. We're not demanding God. We're pleading with God. And God sees our hearts and he desires and he takes care of us and he loves us. One of the, one of the Old Testament scriptures in Malachi, the Old Testament, they were um, taking their, their sacrifices. And in the Old Testament, you're supposed to take the best sacrifice. You're supposed to take the best lamb, the best goat, the best dove, and you're supposed to sacrifice that at the altar to push back our sins and to offer it up to Christ. But Israel at this time, they were, they were taking their best, and they were selling their best for profit, and they would take their blemished, broken lambs, and they would take it for sacrifice. And then they would say, God, I want you to bless me because of what I have done. 
And Malachi, through God, was just saying, saying, I cannot offer this. You've got to be kidding. You mock me with your disobedience and without batting an eyelash, you make requests of fully expect me to grant them. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. God sees our heart. And sometimes we, we say one thing, we want people to see one thing, but we offer God the leftovers. We always have things when somebody says, oh, I'll just give it to the church. You know, our, we have a broken refrigerator, just give it to the church. And I want to say that I thank you for everything that you've ever offered to the church. But I truly believe the church ought to be the best, not the leftovers. I believe the church ought to offer God the best in everything that we do, not our leftovers. I believe God ought to receive your first, not your leftovers. I believe if the church, if the body of Christ would understand that we're offering God our sacrifice, our unblemished land, the priority within our life, we give God our best, not our leftovers, because God in Malachi is the same God today, and he says, I will not be mocked. You try to deceive me, I will not be mocked. We need to offer God our pure heart. We need to offer God our pure life. We need to offer God our pure resources. Because when we give God our best, then God says, now, now because you're trusting me in resources, you're trusting me in your family, you're trusting me in your job, you're trusting me, you're putting me where I need to be, that's when I say, Thank you. And he starts blessing us, honoring us. Because God said, don't be deceived. I will not be mocked. Timing isn't necessarily the biggest problem. I think God is rather easygoing about some type of matters. God says, come on, grow, grow, grow. Just learn. Just understand what I want for your life. My ways are so much better than your ways. So if you do not hear an audible voice of God to say no, it may just say slow down a little bit. But it could be, you know what, I just need to grow. I need to grow spiritually. I need to learn what the Bible has to say. I just want to either say, God, I need to pray. I need the very desires of your heart within my life. I need God's will within my life. I want God to bless me. And if that's the time, when it's time and everything is right, Here's what God says. He says, let's go. Let's go. Let's get on our hearts before God. And let's do what God has called us to do. Let's seek his face. And when we know what we're supposed to do, and God has motivated us, and he's given us the very desires of our heart, it is not good enough just to come to church. It is that time where we pray for others, with others. And I like this scripture. Um, the last verse is very important. It says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call of the elders of the church that they may pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up and he has committed his sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Listen to this last verse. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. That means the guy that's gone through the go stage and the slow stage and the no stage understands what God wants to do with him. He's a righteous man. He's one that has his life lined up. He knows God's word. He knows God's will. He has prayed for God's movement upon his life. He is supposed to be someone that can look at somebody's life and can feel their pain, has apathy and empathy for them. He can identify when somebody is in need. They, the person, the righteous individual, when they pray for somebody, it gets a hold of the heart of God. 
I believe my biggest job at this church is this job, is to pray. I believe your biggest job at your place of employment, spiritually, is prayer. I believe it sets the environment for God's blessing upon people's lives. If the righteous, fervent man or woman that knows God, that's doing what God wants them to do, he prays. He lays his hand on people. He convicts them of their sin because of their communication. God supernaturally uses you because you've been a prayer warrior. Prayer is the heartbeat of God's movement. And the Holy Spirit of God that lives within every soul, that lives within our heart, he's the one that utters our prayers. He's the one that lifts our prayers up to God. When we pray, when we pray, God moves. Here's what we need to do as a church. We need to identify what we need to pray for. You need to identify what you need to pray for. And it can't be, you know, we're not just praying for something that uh, is supernatural or superficial, I mean. We're praying for something that only God can fix. If you have a child that's going in a wrong direction, pray. If you have a sin within your life, if you have that addiction that you cannot break, pray. Ask God to move you. Not to get away from it, not to stick your head in the sand of it, but to deal with the issue. And when we deal with those issues and we identify with those issues, then we can do some great things. Then it intercedes within our life. We pray for others. We, when somebody comes alongside and they say, will you pray for me? We get on our knees and we pray and we care and we love. We tell somebody, hey, I'm praying for you today. It means something when somebody that's love with God and love with somebody, that they'll sit down with them and they'll pray for them. It's interceding. And prayer unleashes God's power and allows God's will to be made within the home. And that's when God will intervene. That's when God will intervene and he say, okay, let's do this thing. If you say, you know, I, I, I pray every once in a while. I just run out of things to pray for. I fall asleep in my prayers. Anybody ever do that? Yeah, fall asleep. That's, that's easy to do. Something that we have a passion for. And that's the heartbeat of God. Prayer. Say your prayers at night. Say your prayer before you eat. Those are words. What I believe God is saying is, if you ask anything in my name, and it's in God's will, God will do great things. Now, there's another side of that. We've had some very difficult times. We've had some people that we love that uh, has passed away. That's been hurt. And very godly individuals that have pleaded with God with tears in their eyes. But yet they are no longer here. Did God hear your prayers? Yeah, he did. It is sad. It is sad when you're at the hospital room and in the last few minutes of someone's life and they ask you to pray. I bow my head and I pray. I pray for God's will. I pray for the healing that would take place if that's God's will. I do not have the answers of why things happen, but I do know the Bible says it's appointed unto man wants to die. That means we're all going to die. I don't know how it's going to take place. But what I have to do is we have to, have to be faithful to God and in our prayer say, Lord, I need you to give me the right heart, to give me the right answers. Uh, we just had Jim Lyon's funeral here yesterday, and, um, and I shared this story many times over the last couple of years. But right after Jim was diagnosed with esophagus cancer, he calls me up in the office, and he said, uh, he said Bruce, um, this is going to be a long road ahead of me. I said, yeah, I, I, I know it is. And he said something that tells me about his spiritual maturity. He said, I just want to be a testimony for Christ. You're my last part of my life. 
Whatever I do, wherever I go, I want to make sure Christ is known. Well, yesterday, right here, we testified about Jim. And uh, Jim is in heaven. You know what? I could not tell you the times I prayed for Jim. I prayed for his health. I prayed for his healing. But Jim is dead. Does that mean that God didn't answer my prayers? God didn't answer the prayer that I wanted. I don't know the significance and the meaning behind that. All I know is when something doesn't go the way that we want it to go does not mean that God does not love you. What we must do is we must accept God's will. His ways are higher than my ways. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. I have to say in my prayer, Lord, I do not know necessarily what to do. And I don't necessarily know how to pray. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit of God knows our inner soul and he will take the things that we do not know and he will utter the words that we do not have to the very ears and the heart of God. So some of the best prayers that you can make are the prayers that you do not speak. Some of the most holy prayers that you will give are the prayers that come out of your eyes as tears because we do not know. But the greatest thing that we have is the heart of God. And God looks at the very intent of our heart. He doesn't look at the outward appearance and what we do and what we say. God knows the innermost part of our life. He knows when we do not know. He knows that we have no idea what to do and how to do it. What we have to do is wholly go before God and say, Lord, I need you. I need you to forgive me. I need you to grow me. And I do not know what to do. I ask you for healing. I ask you for forgiveness. But Lord, whatever takes place, in any scenario, I know that you love me. And your ways are better than my ways. When we have that heart, that's the prayer life of a fervent, righteous individual. And it avails much.